you hear me out? Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you we change the cord out. Can we change the cord? No. Ow. Drop the ball. <laughs> you can hear me now. Right? There we go. All right. Good morning, Lost Story Church. We're glad to see you guys this morning. Uh, you noticed that video. A good friend of mine, Landon Allen, is a member of, well, he's the Central Regional Coordinator for Christians United for Israel. It's an organization that I can thank for taking me to Israel in 2015 on a uh, strategic leadership trip for, of 27 different pastors. You know, we are a church that believes in supporting Israel. Israel. Now, that's a little loud. We're a church that believes in supporting Israel. We Amen. believe that it's a fulfillment of prophecy that the nation was reborn in 1948, and that we as Christians need to support that nation geopolitically, if nothing else, all right? Now, uh, we believe, we have seen, uh, I, we have seen God move mountains, and we've seen people coming to Christ out of the Jewish community a bunch in recent years, the more we as Christians try to embrace the, the Jewish culture, the more we're seeing salvations happen as well. So, uh, you know, there is teaching out there. There's teaching out there that says the Jews don't need Jesus. They've got their own covenant. Don't be misled by any of that. All right. But one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess. You know, a lot of times as, as these Hebraic roots and Christian Jewish uh, organizations pop up and start to come together. You start to hear all kinds of different things, all kinds of different messaging and whatnot, such as the Jews have their own covenant, but make no mistake, they need the Lord as well. So I want to want to clarify on that front as well, but this is a great organization that I, I can give thanks to you for really plugging me into the pro-Israel community, and my dear friend Lyndon Allen asked me to invite all of you out to the Night to Honor Israel, which is coming up. It's, a, it's an evening on May 14th. The day after Mother's Day. The day after Mother's Day, that's right. Where we're going to try to get the Christian community together of all different denominations and just let the Jewish community in Nashville know that we support Israel. We may have, we have, as we've been talking about recently uh, in, in the last few weeks, we've got lots of different theological differences among the church. Obviously, we stand apart from, from the Jewish people on religion, and we believe that faith in Yeshua is necessary for salvation. But, you know, through our support of them geopolitically, if nothing else, like I mentioned, we have seen, uh, the, more, the more we can demonstrate Jesus to the Jewish people, the more we're seeing him enter the Jewish community. So, in any case, I wanted to uh, uh, honor my friend and throw that invite out to you guys this morning. But without any further ado, I'm going to and keep in mind that's May 14th, and if you, we'll talk about it more next week. And if you have any details, we'll start putting them on the Last Word Church family page, all right? Um, all that being said, we'll release our Sunday school class this morning. What's that? Are kids allowed to go? Yes, they are. <laughs> so I don't think there will be child care available. <laughs> Little ones, may the Lord plant a seed in your heart that will reap an eternal reward. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to get started this morning because we've got a lot to get to and not a lot of time. You know, but a lot of times the Lord has other plans for our service, doesn't he? When he just takes over in worship, we just got to let him do his thing. All right? All right, but I'm going to get going right off the bat here because I've got a lot that I do want to get to. Uh, First things first, we're continuing our sermon series, Know What You Believe and Why. We're a church that hammers that, aren't we? We truly want that to be our mantra. We want to know what we believe on every issue. Well, what do you believe about that as a Christian? Well, here's what I believe. We want to be able to answer the questions that the world and people of, even of other denominations uh, have for us. What do you believe on this? We want to know. Not just what we believe, though. We want to know why we believe it. And in recent weeks, we've been tracing the theological roots of a lot of the different things that we believe denominationally, uncovering where a lot of false teaching comes from and uncovering where a lot of great teaching comes from. So first things first, I want to start with doing a little bit of, a little bit of some recap for you guys. Well, actually, actually, before I do that, I want to start with some headlines. Because I believe that this conversation that we're having is incredibly relevant for the times that we're living in. 
And, the, and to, to help make that point, I just want to go over a few things. Can we go to those headlines first, but we'll come back to the verses. First of all, Chuck Missler passed away. This is an interesting year. Chuck Missler is an, if you're not familiar with his work, I implore you to become familiar with his work. He is, in my opinion, the greatest Bible study teacher of the last century. In my opinion. He has so many great materials out on the internet that truly rightly divides the word. Now, I may have a few differences theologically from him here and there. However, it's just a wealth of great information that I would encourage everybody to dive into. If you want to become a serious Bible student, Chuck Missler's work is a great place to start. Anyway, I think it's significant. This year, we've lost Billy Graham, widely considered to be a Moses of our generation by many. Certainly his earlier, his earlier preachings and earlier messaging uh, was very significant, even led my own father to Christ when he was a boy, right? Within the same year, we lose Chuck Missler, who in my opinion, is an, I would put him, to me, he's even, I'd even put him higher as far as what he has meant to me. Uh, I'll dedicate the sermon to him. This <laughs> is what he's meant to me. We lost him this week. And the first thing that I thought when I heard that was good for him. You know, he lost his wife not too long ago. Uh, he's, he was in his latter years. And boy, everything that he has conjectured, conjectured, uh, conjectured over the years, he now knows fully. I'm sure there's a few things where he's thinking, boy, I was way off. <laughs> but this guy, I'm telling you, probably more than not, he was like, well, that's exactly what I thought. I mean, this guy studied the Word of God. He's, he's a real example for us to, to uh, aim for. But let's move on. That happened this week. But also this week we saw a lot of other things happening. Some good news for once. Uh, I don't I always want to share bad news with you. Right? That seems to be the trend that the world is moving. But we did see some good news. We saw uh, the Iowa governor signs fetal heartbeat bill into law. That means if there's a heartbeat, there can be an abortion. Amen. 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 Let's keep going. Let's see what else. At the same time, we see all this. Kane West made the prophecy. I think. How in the world did that happen? Right? Oh, yeah. I think this is the state that we're getting to. <laughs> Have you ever read the book 1984? Right. Anyway, it's, it's, I think we're reaching a, a time in history, a time in history, where the thought police. You can't even think what you want anymore, let alone say what you want. Kane West came out and supported the president, and they're banning him from, from the radio. Kanye. 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 You can tell I'm a big fan, huh? <laughs> Kanye West. He's banned from the radio station. Why does he support the president? Oh, but this is unbelievable, church. The thought police are out of that, and I think it speaks to the hour of history. Uh, let's keep going. What else happened this week? Busy week, as I said. North Korea will open its doors to Christianity? Are you kidding me? Really? Now we know the world is coming to an end. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Christianity has been illegal in North Korea forever. Communist regime. I mean, the Christian church in North Korea has been persecuted like none other. And here they are. Opening the doors to some of the Donald Trump has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. You know the world is coming to an end, right? <laughs> Unbelievable. Busy week. Let's see what else we've got. Netanyahu, I don't know if some of you guys saw his news conference that he had this week, but he revealed a, a secret mission that uh, Israeli spies went into Iran and discovered a treasure trove of documents that show they've been lying all this time. They have never, they had been, they had been pursuing nuclear weapons. They said they hadn't been. This information proves that they were, proves that they've been lying for the last several years, even up until currently. They still don't admit it, even though they're caught red-handed. So uh, it's, this is of paramount importance because the nuclear Iran deal of Barack Obama's that was signed in the last few years, Trump has the option to renew it or do away with it on May 12th. That's coming up. And here, just this past week, Turns out they've been lying to us the whole time, and guess what? Nobody is surprised. Nobody's surprised. This can be this. Very important. Why is this significant to us? Well, we know that in the end times there's going to be a war. Ezekiel 38 39, where Russia and Iran and the Confederation of Nations come against Israel. And so here we see Israel 
and Iran in direct conflict, and I believe it's of prophetic significance. So let's keep going. What else do we have? I don't know how many more we've got, but it was a busy week. Ah, this is huge. So on May 12th, the Iran deal goes away, which is going to cause turmoil, definitely. Uh, people, the, our America's enemies are not going to be happy about this. Europe is not going to be happy about this. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, I don't have a headline for this, but uh, the president of France, Marcon, did I say that one right? Marcon, is putting together a, a uh, uh, commission of ten nations. Interesting. That might be interesting, huh? <laughs> that might be relevant to Daniel, ten nations coming together that an antichrist rises out of. We're not studying that today. But as the Antichrist rises out of the Ten Nation Confederation, he uh, cuts off, kills three of them, and tribulation begins. Anyway, we're seeing the forming of, with everything else going on, we're seeing the forming of a Ten Nation Confederation in Europe. Europe is directly affected by the end of this uh, Iran deal economically. And there's a lot of moving pieces here, and a lot happening just this week. Anything else, Asha? That's it. So, so, I'm telling you, living in this time, this era, nothing like the news frames the hour of history that, that we're living in better, in my opinion. So I believe that it's more important now than ever to know what we believe, but why we believe it, and understand how we arrive at our opinions theologically. Truly, there's a lot of bad teaching. There's a lot of false doctrine that's mixed in with good doctrine. I've always said, you know, every lie has a little bit of truth in it, or nobody would believe it. And there's a lot of lies that are prevalent in the church today. So it's imperative that we take this seriously and begin to understand why we believe what we believe and where that thinking came from. Okay? So, sermon title today, What You Believe and Why, but there's a special, uh, special uh, um, emphasis on understanding our theological outline. What is your theological outline? You know when you're in school, you read, do a book report, you read the book, and then your teacher says, do an outline of the chapter, right? You remember that? <laughs> Every one of us should have a working outline of how we understand the Word of God. How we understand end time prophecy, prophecy in general. How we understand, what's your working outline, theological outline of salvation? How, are, how do you get saved? How do you know that you're saved? What hour of history are we living in? What can we expect to happen? What should that look like? What's my outline of the prophecy of Daniel, of Revelation? What does that all look like? Now I want to do a little bit of review, okay? When we started this a couple weeks ago, we first said, when you understand scripture, it's important to understand interpretation. Do you understand your interpretation of scripture to be literal or allegorical? Allegory. What's the definition of allegory? A story, a poem, a picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning. Typically a moral or political one. Do you interpret scripture allegorically that when you read it, it doesn't mean what it says, it just means something else? Believe it or not, traditionally, for the last 1,500 years, much of the church has interpreted scripture allegorically and not literally. Okay? How do you interpret scripture personally? Ask yourself that question. When I read the word God, I find that when there is, there is allegory in places in the Bible, there are metaphors in the Bible. Typically, when they're given, though, they're directly explained in the following sentence. In most cases, 99% of the cases, Another thing that we've been discussing over the past few weeks has been this, in regards to theology. Is the theology that you have, is it borrowed a theology? Like you have, you hold true to a thinking and theology because it was simply what you were taught by a man, a person? Or did you arrive at your theology because you personally rightly divided the word of truth? As we're instructed to do in 2 Timothy, show yourself to be uh, to be a workman who is not ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, understanding it within its context, in other words. We mentioned this as well, Maes Carmadeus, to make that point. Maes Carmadeus, in, the, in uh, uh, the 16th century, he was a Bible scholar, translated 
uh, translator. He was the first to print the complete English Bible. And he did when he did so, he said, he said this, uh, it shall greatly help you to understand scripture if thou mark not only what is spoken or written, but of whom, to whom, at what time, where, to what intent, under what circumstances, considering what came before and what followed after. In other words, who, what, when, where, and why. When you're studying scripture, and you're trying to figure out what it means, consider who wrote it. Consider who Paul wrote it to. Consider the geopolitical climate at the time. Consider what all of the circumstances are in order to rightly divide the word of truth. That's what we have to do. And in doing so, if you're rightly dividing the word of truth, considering who, what, when, where, and why, how do you arrive at your theology? Do you interpret scripture allegorically or literally? Okay? Allegorically or literally. Are we or without a... Deal? Oh, okay. well, I, can, I have a picture for you guys, but I'll just kind of go over it. Uh, if you'll turn your eyes to illustration number one, is that what you say? <laughs> this, might, this might be the Lord helping me get through stuff I've already said faster. Right? So, you know, as we study scripture, we study, you know, if you were to go to Bible college, Bible college would, would show you and teach you that. That there is, there are these terms that we've never heard of typically, premillennial and amillennial, right? In other words, you, you, you interpret scripture as being literal or allegorical. And in between are all kinds of different places where people fall. We as a church tend to fall, don't tend to, we fall literal. We believe the word of God is the literal word of God. We believe that it's inherent, uh, it's infallible, and that God said what he meant. And then you can take it at face value, and then it means what it says, because he says what he means, all right? Uh, and, how do I get this without the pictures? Let's just turn forward. It's a paramount and it's important so we understand how we interpret scripture, especially when it comes to end time prophecy, in regards to where we're at in history in regards to what's happening in the world all around us. Because if I'm interpreting scripture allegorically, it may lead me to think that something else is about to happen. But if I take it literally, then I think something else is going to happen. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It will directly impact and influence my outline that I've got up here. Right? If I think that things are literal, I have a, a specific set of things that I'm expecting to happen next. If I don't take things literal, I'm kind of left waving around. I don't really know what to expect because anything could mean anything. Like, I think it means this, but it might not because it's allegorical. If it doesn't mean what it says, then what does it really mean? I can only guess, right? So here's the problem with that, especially if we're looking at end-time prophecy and we're looking at the news headlines and trying to understand where we are in the world and what phase of history that we're in. If I don't really know what to expect next, it's really a scary place to be. Uh, one of my favorite things I've always uh, liked to say is, you know, the author of fear is a lack of knowledge. The author of fear is a lack of knowledge, but when you know, there's a certainty, right? There's an expectation of what's to come, but if you don't know what's coming yet, it's, it's, it's a fearful thing. So, what I want to do today is highlight a few things. There's a common understanding, a common understanding uh, that some, not all, but some Protestant prophecy students have. And the common understanding is, you know, I have so many pictures of that, guys. This is not good. <laughs> not good at all. We rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus. I don't even know how to teach us without the pictures. Asher, do we have any... Progress? Okay. All right. Um, let's just go over a few things. Common understanding that we have in Bible prophecy is that there is going to be a, a seven-year tribulation period. Am I right? So, seven-year tribulation period, if we are understanding, if we are understanding, what's that? Daniel 70 weeks graphic. 
pre-tribulation rapture. Some people believe that before the seven-year period, we're going to be raptured. Some people believe it's middle of the tribulation. Some people will be raptured. Some people believe that we're going to be here through the whole tribulation period and all of that, all of the terrible things that are going on, so we better store up on food and water and everything else, right? Even people that take the Bible liberally can disagree on this issue because some allegory starts to enter. And sometimes you interpret the scripture literally for the most part, but not completely, and that's where things start to get... I'm telling you, the more allegory enters your thinking, enters your interpretation of scripture, the more confusing things get. Okay? We believe that God meant what he said and, and says what he means, and we prescribe to a preacher of your relation rapture theory. In large part for this, and let me give you a few... Uh, few uh, reasons. If you're undecided on this, maybe it'll help you. There are different beliefs, and there are problems with some different beliefs. First of all, in regards to post-tribulation, if you believe that Jesus is not coming back until the tribulation period is over, you've got some problems with that thinking. Why? Because it requires the church to be here during the seven eighth week, first of all, which I think there's a lot of problems with that, uh, which I'll cover momentarily. But also, Israel and the church are mutually exclusive. They're separate entities as you interpret scripture. The church would have to experience God's wrath if we're here. That's, you have to understand, in the tribulation, especially towards the last three and a half years of tribulation, you know, the church just suffers right now. The church suffers persecution right now, but it's at the hands of Satan right now. You have to understand that in the end time, in this tribulation period, the great tribulation is the last three and a half years, God himself pours wrath out on the wicked of the earth. So if we're here, we're getting wrath dumped on us. That's a problem. That's a problem because we're promised not to suffer wrath by God. Uh, uh, Post-tribulation, we're promised not to experience it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. And how can the bride come back with him if we're here and not with him already? Who will populate the millennium if we're all dead, right, from tribulation? Who are the sheep and the goats? There's, uh, and again, if, uh, there's a lot of information I'm trying to cover in a short amount of time, so if you want my notes, please, I'll email them to you. Let's see the next one. There's also a mid-tribulation uh, uh, theory that I believe has its problems. These views are built on a limited scripture, and they're not supported historically. The mid-trib rapture theory is new. It's not a historical theory that you can find in any ancient church documents. It was not a belief that was held by any ancient church fathers. The 70th week is defined by a covenant and enforced by the coming world leader in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, for a seven-year period, a whole seven-year period. The Great Tribulation is the last half of the 70th week. And the leader cannot be revealed until after the rapture if you read 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 6 through 9. It's often a confusing issue for people when they, when, they, when they read this scripture. Again, this theory is built on limited scripture, little, little, no historical references. And if we simply read 2 Thessalonians, we have that verse, uh, verse uh, chapter 2, verse 6 through 9, we find... This, Paul tells us, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains, which is the Holy Spirit, will do so until he is taken out of the way. Who is the Holy Spirit in? The Holy Spirit resides in us. Right? And the Holy Spirit is, did we think it's wicked now? Boy, it's going to be wicked when the Holy Spirit is gone. Church. But the Holy Spirit resides within us. So he's restrained, but only until the Holy Spirit is taken out of, out of the way. When the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, then the lawless one will be revealed. Then the lawless one will be revealed. The lawless one is revealed at the beginning of the tribulation. Why? He starts, his, he initiates the peace field. Whom the Lord will consume with breath out of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Much of this study, much of this study that we've been doing for the last three weeks is centered on what the first church fathers taught. We've been tracing our theology, both good and bad, okay? And that's so important. It's so important to know where these theologies come from. In recent weeks, we've already established 
that the ancient church fathers interpreted scripture literally. They interpreted it literally and they frowned upon the allegorization of scripture. And I see this next picture. Who are the ancient church fathers? These are the disciples. Polycarp lived with John for 20 years. Lived with him for 20 years before and after John wrote Revelation. He had disciples, Arrhenius and Justin Martyr. Arrhenius had a disciple, Hippolytus, right? These are, these are recent generations. This would be as if my successor, if I had a successor, they would know what I believe. And if I was a disciple of Christ, I would know what Christ taught me better than anybody, right? So the writings of the ancient church fathers carry a lot of weight because they're so close to the event of the crucifixion, resurrection, and the coming of God. They should carry a lot of weight, so we should look at them and consider how we interpret Scripture. And they interpreted Scripture literally, not allegorically, okay? So, haven't we, let me ask you this. Have we, haven't we always heard that the disciples in the early church thought that Jesus was going to come for them in any second? I mean, I did. I grew up hearing that all the time. I would hear, you know, well, and so then I would think, you know, if they thought that he was coming for them any second and he didn't, why should I expect it to be us, right? I've heard, I'm telling you, I'm wondering if you guys have heard it because I grew up thinking that. If they were waiting for Christ to come in any second. Problem is, is that it's not so. Arrhenius said this. Remember who Arrhenius is, so, so, disciple of Polycarp, who lived with John for 20 years. I'm telling you, if anybody should know how to interpret what John was saying and teaching, it's these guys. He said the day of the Lord is as a thousand years, and in the six days created things were completed. It is evident, therefore, they will come to an end in the six thousand year. Oh, well, there was only the year four thousand something or other when they were teaching, so they knew there was still two thousand years yet to go. They didn't think Christ was coming any second. They knew there was still another two thousand years to come before he would. Hippolytus, Arrhenius' disciple, then said this, the Sabbath is a type of the future kingdom. It's the type of the future kingdom. For a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Since then, in six days, the Lord created all things. It follows that in six thousand years, all will be fulfilled. Keep the Sabbath. Why? Don't forget, it's a type and shadow. It's prophecy. That's why he said keep it and don't forget it. All right? We've also, on the same line of thinking, we've also heard that the pre-tribulation rapture is a new idea, started by a guy named Darby in the 1850s or something, right? Again, not so. Pre-tribulation eschatology, not a new idea. The Epistle of Barnabas was written in 100 AD, 100 AD, okay? Taught pre-tribulation rapture. The radius wrote against heresies in 177 A.D., taught pre-tribulation rapture. Hippolytus was a disciple of Arrhenius in the second century. Disciple taught pre-tribulation rapture. Justin Martyr, again, we just saw him on our chart, close ancient church fathers, pre-tribulation rapture. Ephraim, the Syrian, taught pre-tribulation rapture. Let me give you a couple quotes because I'm out of time. I can't believe this. <laughs> What did they believe in regards to the end, time, the end times? We're just going to have to go late because I can't leave without doing this today. All right? In Against Heresies in 180 AD, this is only 110 years from the destruction of the temple. Arrhenius, who was a disciple of Polycarp, who lived with John. Even Arrhenius says that he was taught personally by John in John's later years. He said, when in the end that church will be suddenly caught up from this, then it is said, there will be tribulations such as has never been since the beginning nor will be. After the catching up, then tribulation begins. I'll give you another one. Arrhenius in Against Heresies, uh, chapter 5, verse 35. He says, there is a resurrection of the just that takes place after the destruction of the Antichrist. He's talking of the resurrection at the end of the seven-year tribulation period and all nations under his rule. Many believers will make it through the tribulation. As we know, there will be tribulation saints and we replenish the earth. In the resurrection, we will have fellowship and communion with the holy angels and union with spiritual beings. The new heavens and earth are first created and then Jerusalem descends. I really want you to get this part. These are not my words. 
These are all literal things, Arrhenius said, and Christians who allegorize them are immature Christians. That may be, might be harsh words, but John meant what he said. The scriptures are meant to be interpreted literally. There will literally be a seven-year tribulation period, a literal New Jerusalem that comes. All of the revelation is meant to be literal. Ephraim, this is later on, 306 AD. Ephraim said this, and he wrote his sermon called On the Last Times, the Antichrist, and the End of the World. I'll give you this one more. For all the saints and elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord, lest they see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. Now, do you still think that pre-tribulation rapture theory is a new thing? birth in the 1800s. No, the first church. John wrote Revelation, taught Polycarp. Polycarp taught pre-tribulation rapture, taught his disciple Arrhenius blatantly, we just read it, pre-tribulation rapture theory on how to understand the scripture. How do you interpret your scripture? Is your theology borrowed because somebody taught it for you and you've never put it in the homework yourself? Hey, well, and that's a lot of us. That was me for many years. I tell, I tell people, I was pre-tribulation rapture theorist because my parents were. But then as I began to grow in my 20s and study for myself, I became mid-trib rapture theorist. Then, Amber stumbled onto some work that was very compelling and convincing, and I became a preterist. And he wasn't going to come back till the end. I was pretty convinced. I was telling my mom even, it was like 25 or something, the great delusion might be this whole rapture theory. But as I continued to dig deeper and deeper and deeper, <coughs> deeper, I came all the way back around to the place where it all started, to the same belief of the first church. The Bible means what it says, and it says what it means, and it says, if you take it literally, there will be a rapture, and catching away, there will be a seven-year tribulation period. This is what it says. To not believe that or agree with that is to allegorize scripture. Several, I'm out of time. I could just got, probably go for another hour. Yeah, we're, we have communion today. We're just going to do it outside after service ends, okay? Well, let me show you if you have a few pictures of, of, out of uh, some book references. I literally just took some photos of some books to show you. When I'm talking about the theological outline, I think we all need to have them. First, understand, Nick. Do your study and decide how you interpret scripture. That way you can understand what you believe and understand why you believe it. And then you can form an outline based on how you interpret scripture. I will say if you're allegorizing, it's hard to come up with an outline though, because anything can mean anything. But you have those photos in there, Bob, of the books. Here's one, Arrhenius. We know who he is, right? This was his outline of what's to happen. He's, he believes that the church will fall into apostasy. Then the Antichrist, he believes he'll be born in man. Throughout his whole writing of against heresies, he gives you all of his reasons. It's a fascinating read. He believes that there will be a start of uh, tribulation for seven years. It will begin with the rapture of the church. This is Arabians. And then the temple will be rebuilt, and ten nations will destroy Mystery Babylon. After that, who is Mystery Babylon? Uh, I don't want to tell you. Uh, <laughs> it might not be good news for us Americans. I don't know. In the middle of the seven years, the Antichrist will set up, and God, we won't be here. Amen? Amen? Yes. Again, if you allegorize scripture, there's great cause for fear. Because there's no blessed assurance that we won't be here. And I'm telling you, we should be afraid to be here. We should be so afraid to be here that if you know anybody who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, you should get on it and share the good news. All right? The end of the seven-year tribulations, it will be end with the second coming of Christ when he doesn't just appear in the clouds, but he actually sets his foot down on the Mount of Olives and, come, and sets up his uh, millennial temple and a millennial reign. All right, we've got one more. Let's keep going. Hippolytus, is he next? No, this is Ephraim. Ephraim has his own outline of what's going to happen in the end times. Nation of Israel was the, would be dissolved. Guess what? It was, okay? All these things that happened. Then the seven years begins. What happens again? He believed in the rapture of the church would come, would come first, Ephraim, written in 305 AD. 
right? Much, much of this is the same at that point. Let's see the next page. Well, he, he, is, he even has a more thorough outline. Okay, this is on to Hippolytus. He just describes, again, apostasy of the church through sorcery, false miracles. Apostasy of the church through Gnosticism. What were we talking about last, last week? But how all of these ancient Gnostic beliefs from, from uh, the, the Egyptian Essenes are even to this day present in the church. The church has been, has been uh, uh, splintered into denominations based on Gnostic beliefs that have entered the church and separated us. Right? Uh, next page. The church shall apostasy. Many of these old, old guys believe there will be great apostasy in the church. Do we see apostasy in the church today, by the way? I think we do. Right? Cross the street, big time. Big time, big time. That's the truth. A lot of this looks the same. A lot of this looks the same. He believes that the Antichrist will be from the tribe of the Ant again. That's interesting. Next page. Let's see here. Gnosticism would return again. He believed that would happen. That's what we see. He believes. The Antichrist about born in the Golan would be born in the Golan Heights. And all this is very interesting. Uh, towards the beginning of the seven years, rapture of the church. Rapture, pre-tribulation rapture here is not a new idea. It is the theology of the disciples of the disciples. See, we read the disciples' own words, and it would lead us to believe that there's a seven-year tri uh, tribulation and a rapture before that tribulation. But then when we begin to allegorize a certain thing, well, maybe that scripture doesn't mean what it says on face value. Maybe it means something else. Well, you know what I challenge you to do? Go to the disciples of the disciples and see if, see if that's how they interpret the scripture. And they did not. They did not allegorize scripture. They actually condemned those for being heretics. And they did. Is this interesting? I hope so. A lot of work in this. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to have to close here because we're so, that's so much good stuff. In a moment, church, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. The last trumpet here, it denotes a time to leave. When the camps of the Israelites as they wandered through the desert were Right in the lead, they would sound the last trumpet. That meant let's move out. Anybody ready to move out? Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh. I'm out of time already over time. Let's see what else I got. I can have time for that. <laughs> we get time for that. Let's see. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10. And we're going to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. There's a rescue mission that's being hatched right now. And it's coming. We're, we're imprisoned. We're in bondage to sin and death there. But through him, but through him, we have eternal life. Okay. And there's wrath coming for the wicked of this world. Oh, boy. Is there wickedness in this world, church? And God will not be patient with it forever. And he doesn't want his kids here. He doesn't want his bride here. There's reason for hope, and I'll end on this one. Luke chapter 21, verse 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, we are in a bad spot in time. Uh, with every eye closed and every head bowed, and... I saw Pam's hand a second ago. Maybe we can do a little bit of talking. We're going to have to boogie out of here, guys, because we've got to be out in 20 minutes. I'll dress after we hear. Okay. Um, every eye closed, every head bowed. If you're here this morning, the Lord's moving on your heart in whatever way it is, I couldn't. Some of you I couldn't guess. Some of you I bet I couldn't even guess. 
But if the Lord is moving on your heart, if he's drawing himself to you in any way, maybe it's a desire, even if it's as small, of a, small as a mustard seed, but a desire is birthed in your heart to dig deeper and figure out what you believe and why. And not don't just take another man's word for it, but go to the word of God. Go to the writings of the early church fathers for confirmation. So many of our teachers today, they read the scripture for themselves, they form an opinion based on their own intellect, and that's the end of it. Some denominations and some cults are born out of that. There's no need for that. The Lord has given us such a resource, such a resource on how we can form our, form our theology and our understanding of who he is and what he's doing, what he's promised us and what is when, when we look at the headlines, what, what, what's really going on? We can know. We can look and know what to expect, church. If the Lord's living in your heart and your mind, whatever it is, and you want to lay your heart down at the foot of his throne, and you want to say, Lord, I don't know what I don't know, <laughs> but I want you to show me. Whatever it is, I want you to raise your hand. You can put it right back down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus, we speak revelation and insight for your people, Father. But we speak encouragement, God. I speak that a love of your word would be birthed, Father. The word of God is so cool. <laughs> your word, Lord, is so fascinating, so rich. Lord, I just thank you for your word. Thank you for your person. I thank you for who you are. Thank you for the way that you love us, Jesus. See your people here this morning, Father. Receive the petitions of their hearts, Father. We speak them answered in the name of Yeshua. If you're here this morning and you want to recommit your heart to Jesus Christ or you're watching this online, maybe it's for the first time, maybe it's for the first time in a long time that you know it's time. You know what hour it is. You want to be ready. You want to be ready for him. Whether he comes in 10, 10 days or 10 years, you want to be ready. If that's you here this morning, raise your hand. Angels rejoice when even one comes. There's a party in heaven every time. I don't think it's 10 years, but <laughs> let's pray. Jesus, pray with me if you're raising your hand. Jesus, I believe that you're God. I believe that you love me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. Lord, come into my heart and make me whole. God, fill that hole, Father, that just never seems to go away. Fill that hole that only you can fill. God, fill my mind with thoughts of gratitude. Fill my spirit, Lord, with gratitude that I'd no longer be a slave to sin. I'd no longer be a slave to fear, God. Lord, teach me how to understand your word, Father. Lead me, give me discernment. Give me knowledge and give me revelation, Father. Give me a desire in my heart to study your word and to know you better, God, and to walk with you closer, Father. Oh, you're so good, Father. Lord, come into the hearts of your people as they lift them up to you, as they dedicate their lives to you, as they ask you to be, to be your Savior. Jesus, be our Savior. We need you. Oh God, we need you. Jesus, we need you, Yeshua. Walk with us all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he pour favor out of you. May you walk in his grace and understanding, and may you prosper in all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, we're all going to celebrate a 50th anniversary. If you need directions, that's right, Joyce and Buster. If you need directions, let's get it all together, guys. All right? We'll have a meeting outside, but we're going to break this down. Yes, the directions are on the page.